Hi, this is Nancy Reed, and I'm going to continue the ophthalmology lectures for University of Lynchburg's Master's of Physician Assistant Program. The topics that we're going to cover in this section is anterior eye disorders. This includes hypobian, pterygium, pinguecula, cataract, keratitis, corneal ulcer, episcleritis, and scleritis. The first thing we're going to talk about is hypobian. This is very much like a hyphema, but instead of having blood in the anterior chamber, the cause that uh, is pus in the anterior chamber. And infections of the iris and the uvea, uh, uvea can be caused by both systemic as well as local conditions. Some causes for hypobian or underlying, underlying diseases such as tuberculosis, herpes simplex virus, Lyme disease, muscular sclerosis, chickenpox, and psoriatic arthritis. So the treatment for this is to treat the underlying condition. At the same time, you have to watch to make sure the hypobian um, resolves and you have to continually check interocular pressures to make sure there's not too much pressure in the anterior chamber. A pterygium, it's a fairly common condition um, that is a benign. It's, uh, you can see it by just observing the eye. You don't have to have any kind of special equipment or any kind of special test. And when you just look at the eye, you'll see a fleshy triangle of tissue encroaching on the cornea. And we, I tell people, think of a pterodactyl wing. It almost looks like a pterodactyl wing. So pterygium is that pterodactyl triangular shaped tissue. And you'll see these um, with increased incidence with people who have sun, wind, sand, and dust exposure. So for instance, um, people who live in the Southwest United States, also a group that you'll see this very common in is migrant farm workers who are outside. Um, one of the best things that you can do to help with, to prevent this is to have them wear sunglasses. That helps protect the eye uh, and prevents this from starting. If it does develop, the only treatment is to do surgery and we reserve surgery until the actual uh, pterygium in encroaches on the central uh, visual acuity. So as you can see in the picture below, the pterygium has crossed over the limbus, it's crossed over the pupil, and it's blocking the vision. So this would be a surgical um, condition at this point in time. If it was back um, behind the limbus, then there's nothing really to do for it. Pinguecula is a yellow elevated nodule on either side of the cornea. It's most commonly seen on the nasal side though. It's common in um, people over the age of 35. Pinguaculas rarely grow, but inflammation can occur, so they can you know, become more red and less red at any given time. And they're very concerning to people, um, but they are also a benign condition. And treatment is artificial tears, and you can give a short course of topical uh, NSAIDs. And here's another picture of a pinguecula up close. And you see it's on the nasal side of the eye. I'm sorry, it's on the temporal side of the eye on this, on this particular picture. Cataracts um, is a lens opacity causing blurred vision and gradual vision loss without pain or redness. The, the lens actually just becomes cloudy. And you can see this um, in with the blind eye. A lot of times you don't have to have any kind of special equipment. It's very common in third world countries. And it's, it's sad because um, removing the opacified lens and putting in a uh, interocular re lens replacement would prevent blindness in these people. But unfortunately in third world countries, you're not gonna be able to get those types of surgeries done. Um, etiology is, in it increases with age. Senile cataracts is the most common. There can, um, you babies can be born with cataracts. These are called congenital cataracts. And it's usually due to exposure uh, uh, in utero to rubella or CMV. So that would be one thing that I would keep in mind. So congenital cataracts due to exposure uh, to rubella or CMV in utero. 
risk factors are people who are smokers and who have chronic corticosteroid use. And signs and symptoms include gradual vision loss and um, a whitening of the pupil. The treatment for this is typically uh, surgery, ultrasonic fragmentation, or replacement of the interocular lens. And here are some examples of cataract. And again, you can see this white opacity of the lens. And these people will start to uh, complain of gradual vision loss and, and blurriness in the vision. So we're going to talk about keratitis now. There are many different types of keratitis. There are bacterial keratitis, there's viral keratitis, uh, protozoan keratitis, um, and then exposure keratitis and environmental keratitis. So what keratitis is, is just a uh, generic term for inflammation of the cornea. Um, so a bacterial keratitis is uh, an infection of the cornea due to a bacterial um, causative agent. It's usually aggressive and is often due to pro, uh, prolonged contact lens wearing or corneal trauma. And it's often caused by pseudomonas, specifically in contact lens wearers, um, strep, staph, and moraxilla. So it's very, very important um, when you're doing your history for someone who has an eye condition to find out if they wear contacts, what type of contacts, and are they wearing their contacts correctly? So are they, do they wear daily contacts and they've had them in for four days? Um, then that's an issue. And you start thinking about bacterial keratitis and your suspicion goes up um, that, that maybe a, the agent may be pseudomonas. So these people will come in and they'll complain of eye pain. They'll have redness. The cornea will be like this uh, fuzzy color, um, like a white color like cloudiness and the cornea may have uh, ulcerations. You may or may not also have a hypobian. Um, diagnosis, you do want to do a gram stain or culture uh, for these because you want to make sure that you're targeting the correct causative agent. So if they're a contact lens wearer, you just go ahead and assume that it's pseudomonas and you treat accordingly. So if it's a gram positive agent, you'll use cephalosporin um, ophthalmology drops. And if it's a gram negative, you'll use fluoroquinolone or aminoglycosides um, ophthalmologic drops. So there are two types of viral keratitis. There's herpes simplex keratitis and herpes zoster ophthalmologus. So herpes simplex keratitis um, is uh, ulcers on the cornea due to herpes simplex virus. And the picture in the bottom um, is what we call a dendritic lesion. And you will only see a dendritic lesion if you do a fluorescein stain. So all of these guys who you think have keratitis, it's very, very important that you do a, a fluorescein stain on them. Um, the signs and symptoms of uh, this condition, again, the people come in and have that foreign body sensation, they'll have light sensitivity, they'll have redness, and they'll have blurry vision. Keep in mind, uh, like burn that picture of that dendritic lesion into your eye. Um, oftentimes on standardized tests, they will have a clinical scenario for you and they will say, on uh, fluorescein stain, you see this. And that is a classic picture of a dendritic lesion. So we treat uh, herpes simplex virus keratitis with a cyclovir ointment. And you should never give a person who has herpes simplex keratitis steroids. It can actually make it worse. Um, does, sometimes ophthalmologists prescribe that, yes. But again, this is something that you would leave for the ophthalmologist to prescribe. So from a standpoint of a general practitioner in a family practice setting or in an urgent care setting, ER setting, never, 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 never prescribe these guys steroids. Um, get them on acyclovir ointment, forward them on um, to the ophthalmologist uh, in a pretty quick manner and it, let them decide to give them steroids. But steroids can make this uh, much worse. So herpes zoster ophthalmologist. So this condition can affect 
the cornea. It can also affect the sclera, the conjunctiva. Um, so it's not just a keratitis. But it occurs when varicella zoster virus is reactivated in um, cranial nerve 5. And it represents about a quarter of all cases of her herpes zoster. And one of the telltale signs is these people will have periorbital vesicular rash. And you can have permanent sequelae of this uh, to include chronic ocular inflammation, loss of uh, vision, and debilita debilitating pain. So the person will present with a history um, they'll have flu-like symptoms such as fatigue, malaise. They may have a low-grade fever that lasts up to uh, one week that actually happened before the rash appears. They may have pain and tingling preceding where the rash is at. And signs and symptoms include that periorbital vesicular rash and Hutchinson sign. And this is a picture on the right of Hutchinson sign. The tip of the nose is involved in this. And if the tip of the nose is involved, you have to assume that the eye is also involved. Um, the, tip, the symptoms are usually unilateral um, in nature because, again, um, herpes zoster affects dermatones. And you can have a keratitis, um, a uveitis, and you can also have increased intraocular pressure. And look at um, the picture you can see his, um, the patient's right eye is affected and look at the difference in his pupils. So um, you don't want to miss this one. So Hutchinson sign is one of those, um, those uh, words that they will use on standardized tests that are clues that you automatically have the diagnosis of herpes zoster. So make sure you keep that in mind. Hutchinson sign is uh, infection are affecting the tip of the nose, which then indicates that an eye is also affected. So treatment, you want to start these guys on antiviral medication within 72 hours after the appearance of the rash to reduce ocular involvement. You can give them acyclovir, valcyclovir, uh, famcyclovir. Uh, if it's complicated by anterior uveitis, you may have to add topical steroids or cyclopegics. So another type of keratitis is fungal keratitis. So there's a fungal infection um, of the cornea. And this is most commonly seen in um, those who work outside uh, and have had some sort of uh, exposure to plant material or those who work in an agricultural setting. And the eyes uh, with chronic ocular surface disease and it, it's increased in contact lens wearers. So the cornea will have multiple stromal abscesses with uh, relatively little epithelial loss. Most get corneal scrapings and culture uh, media suitable for fungi. So you have to go in, you have to scrape it, and you have to make sure you're putting on the proper um, medium. Otherwise, you're not going to get the correct diagnosis. And Unfortunately, with this condition, the diagnosis is often delayed because people think that it's bacterial and they'll give them um, a antibiotic ointment and they're treating the wrong thing. So if you have somebody who you treat for bacterial keratitis and they're not getting better, they're getting worse, especially if they have like a history of working around plant material in an agricultural setting, you have to start thinking that you may have a fungal keratitis and then you're gonna to have to do a corneal scraping. Um, not you, but an ophthalmologist will have to do a corneal scraping in order to get the diagnosis. Treatment is topical antifungal preparations. You may have to um, have systemic, uh, systemic antifungals. And then if the cornea is damaged, has extensive damage, you may have to do corneal graftings um, after everything is healed. So this is an example of fungal keratitis, and it has that feathery look to it. Um, I don't know if you can appreciate that, that it looks like a, a nice fluffy feather or cloud appearance. And this is someone who got a fungal infection after having eye surgery. And again, here's another example of uh, fungal keratitis, and it has that cloud appearance to it. 
acanthoamoeba keratitis um, is also uh, common in contact lens wear. It's a, but it's, it's seen in contact lens wearers, but it's a relatively uncommon protozoan infection caused by acanthoamoeba. And signs and symptoms include pain, blurred vision, photophobia, excess tearing, and foreign body sensation. So the history, and this is why you have to get a really, really good history on these guys. Again, you may have somebody that you thought had bacterial keratitis. You treat them. It's not getting better, not getting better. Um, you got to get a good history on these people. So if, if you have somebody who says, you know, oh, I'm a contact lens wearer and I didn't have any contact solution, so I ran my contact lens underneath some tap water um, and put it back in my eye, or I went swimming with my contact lenses in or showering or I was in a hot tub with my contact lenses in, your suspicion for acantho amoeba keratitis goes up. Again, it's not a common infection, but it's one that you don't want to miss. And and you're going to get this diagnosis because of the history. So the diagnosis, you have to do a corneal uh, scraping and put it underneath a, a confocal microscopy, which again, that's you know clearly above the primary care level, but um, that's how it's treated and or that's how it's diagnosed and treated. Uh, treatment includes topical uh, bionides, probably is the most effective primary treatment. Systemic NSAIDs, corneal grafting may be needed on this one as well. So um, here's the uh, microscopy. You can see um, the uh, protozoan in the layers of tissue here. And they also have this halo type appearance that you see on the right hand side. The last type of keratitis is due to environmental exposure. So um, people can get uh, exposure keratitis, which is due to dryness of the cornea caused by incomplete and adequate eyelid exposure. So old people whose eyes don't shut correctly can get this exposure keratitis. It's really important to make sure that those guys have eye drops to keep the eyes lubricated. Um, you can also get a photokeratitis which is due to uh, intense uh, ultraviolet radiation exposure. And that happens in people who are like skiers and they go out on the slopes and they don't have their um, their goggles on or people who get uh, or welders and don't put their mask on when they're welding. And that's called welder's arc eye. And so photokeratitis this is extremely, extremely, extremely painful. Um, so got to make sure that you get the history on those as well. We're going to move on now to corneal ulcer. Um, all those keratitises can move on to a corneal ulcer. And there are some non-infectious causes, such as the exposure keratitis, um, and it's because of severe dry eyes, or you can get it because of severe allergic eye disease. And signs and symptoms are painful red eye with photophobia, tearing, circumcorneal injection, and you may or may not have discharge. Uh, delayed treatment may lead to intraocular infection and corneal scarring. And then the treatment is based on the cause. So if you think you have a corneal ulcer because of a bacteria, um, then you have to treat it with an antibacterial. If it's because of exposure keratitis, then you have to treat it with um, artificial tears. So here's an example of a corneal ulcer, and you can see the, the divot in the cornea right here. And the larger the corneal ulcer, the uh, greater the chances are that you're, you may have to do some sort of surgical uh, intervention such as uh, corneal grafting. So you got to treat corneal ulcers early and aggressively. If you have a corneal ulcer, this too would be an immediate referral to ophthalmology. And a lot of times you don't have to have a specialized tool to be able to see this. You don't have to do fluorescein stain to be able to see this, but we do go ahead and fluorescein stain this because you may have this larger one here that you can see with your blind eye, but you may have another one in a different location that's just starting that you can't see. So all these guys get fluorescein stains. The last two conditions we're going to talk about are episcleritis and scleritis. 
And epoch scleritis is a um, benign condition um, that really can make people upset because their eyes are always red and you have these um, veins that are visible. So it's self-limiting, it's reoccurring, it's an idiopathic inflammation of the episcleral tissue that doesn't affect vision. It doesn't affect the person at all. It's just not the prettiest thing to look at. It's most common in young adults and it affects females greater than males. Um, signs and symptoms include hyperemic endemitous tissue and you may have um, raised nodules. There, uh, the palpebral conjunctiva is typically normal appearing. So the treatment, it's self-limited. You really don't have to do anything for it, but most people want you to do something for it because it's not the, the prettiest condition to look at. Topical corticosteroids is how you treat this. So you want to get the inflammation down and you give uh, uh, prednisone acetate 1%. You can also use topical vasoconstrictors such as uh, tetrahydrozalazine. Scleritis is an inflammation of the sclera. Uh, it's relatively uncommon, must be differenti differentiated from episcleritis. So the reason why this is really important is 50% of cases are associated with some other systemic disease. So these people typically will have um, some sort of connective tissue disease or some sort of autoimmune disease that may have went undiagnosed in the first um, sign or symptom that is noticeable is the inflammation of the sclera. And risk factors, it's um, just like most autoimmune diseases, um, 40 to 50 year olds um, are at the greatest risk factor and male greater than female. So it's in that older age group um, that you start to see this. Signs and symptoms, um, you're gonna have pain, redness, tearing, photophobia, and decrease visual acuity. And here's the key that you guys have to keep in mind and take home from this particular slide. The patient is gonna complain of this boring, lancinating pain that often wakes them up from sleep. So they just have this awful, awful pain that wakes them up from sleep. When you look at their eye, um, their eye is gonna be discolored and they're gonna have a blue hue of the sclera. So where the other uh, condition, episcleritis, you saw, the blood vessels, behind those blood vessels, you're gonna see this blue hue. So treatment, um, you have to treat the underlying systemic disease, and they may or may not know what that is um, at the time that they present to you. Top, topical corticosteroid drops um, will help this condition for the eye. Topical NSAIDs, systemic cortico, um, I'm sorry, systemic corticosteroids, shouldn't be drops, just systemic corticosteroids and then systemic NSAIDs. Surgical intervention may be required if the sclera starts to thin. And as you can see here, this is much worse looking than the episcleritis, and you can see that blue hue behind the torturous veins there. So episcleritis, you have to keep in mind that you're gonna, if they don't already have a diagnosis of something, you're gonna um, probably start looking and autoimmune diseases and connective tissue diseases. So we're gonna do a test question here. A 36 year old sexually active male presents with a complaint of a foreign body sensation, light sensitivity, redness, blurred vision, dendritic lesions are seen on fluorescein stain. What medication is contraindicated in this patient? If you said topical steroids, you are absolutely correct. We don't want to give someone with a dendritic lesion, which is indicating herpes simplex virus topical uh, steroids.